Hello, everyone. Welcome to Build It Better. I am Lindsay Wardell, software engineer at This.Labs. With me today is our guest, James Snell. Welcome, James. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Uh, could you introduce yourself for our, our audience who may not be familiar with you at this point? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, like I said, James Snell. I'm um, uh, on the Node Technical Steering Committee. Uh, I've been contributing to Node for a while now. Uh, I am. I have been with Nearform for the past four years. Um, just just announced here uh, like two days ago, three days ago, that I'm that I'm actually moving on. Got something new starting uh, in, in in just a few weeks. Um, not quite ready to talk about where that, you know, what, what that is yet, but uh, I'm not leaving the JavaScript space. I'm still going to be, you know, part of Node and, you know, still be around. So, but it's exciting. Well, I'm excited to hear about it when you can't talk about it. Cool. Uh, so, and one question I like to ask people in general is just how did how did you get into programming? And in particular, I'd love to hear the story about how you got onto the steering committee, um, since. I don't get to talk to that many people who are on the steering committee. That's that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's you know it, it, it's definitely been a fun ride. You know, and you know the, the, those two questions: how I got started and how I got on the steering committee. There, you know, there, there's many you know, a couple of decades in between those times. So <laughs> we'll start. The, you know, on the I mean that's way. fair, <laughs> right? Um, I you know, so I, I started writing code just when I when I was eight years old. Uh, parents bought uh, an old uh, Tandy TRS eighty. Computer it was uh, uh, you know had had fun with that and then just kind of you know tinkered around on it you know I was the kid that would hurry up and finish the uh, uh, work in class then run to the computer in the back of the room and you know and write games on the on the computer um, uh, you know pretty much all through junior high and high school and then uh, sometime in during high school a uh, 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 coworker of my mom's got Borland C plus plus and gave her a copy of it. Uh, to bring home to me. And so I just started hacking away on stuff. And after, I think, creating two viruses and, you know, uh, you know, other things that I probably shouldn't have been doing, um, you know, figured out I actually had a, uh, 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 an enjoy, you know, I really enjoyed doing this stuff. So just kind of started from there. So, yeah, you know, it was, uh, uh, you know, a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun back then. As far as the steering committee is concerned, you know, getting in, involved with Node, that you know, it, it's it's kind of a fun story. So uh, I, I joined the project in 2015. All right, we go back two years earlier than that. I was doing some prototype work for some of the IETF standards and stuff that I was working on at the time, and you know, had never really looked at Node. And I was like, okay, you know, you know, no, this Node thing is popular. I'll just do the prototype work there and see, you know, and learn a little bit about it. I ended up finding a bug in the HTTP stack. Um, at the time, and you know, I, I had I had written my own HTTP stacks for a while. I'd been involved with the standards for a while, you know, so spotted it pretty quickly. When I reported it, and this was 2013, and the project was having quite a few kind of community issues. As soon as I reported the bug, I was promptly told by one of the core contributors at the time that I didn't know how this kind of software worked. <laughs> I was like, well, that's not very friendly. Um, so I opened the pull request and walked away from it. Right, um, you pull request to, to fix it and then just walked away. And they really didn't have any desire to get involved with Node at all anymore. Uh, at the time, I was with IBM, and, and in 2014, the company decided that they wanted to start investing in Node and getting involved with it, but they, could, they really couldn't do so safely while the uh, this was the time the IOJS fork was happening. Uh, you know, there was a lot of community stuff that was happening. They couldn't really invest safely while all this stuff was happening. So my boss at the time, um, the, the, the literal instruction was to get involved with the project and fix it. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, you know, and, and obviously, you know, the only way to, 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 to start making a positive impact on a project is to get involved in it. Uh, so, you know, I just started contributing. Um, uh, I spent the first, I think three months doing nothing but triage of the issues and pull requests that were there. Um, their, their issue tracker was horribly out of date. Uh, and I, th I think in one day I went through over a thousand issues just saying, what's the current status on this? Has this landed? Has, has this been fixed? And that was my introduction to a lot of the other Nord Nord contributors because suddenly they were getting these like a thousand notifications from some guy named James that they'd never heard of. <laughs> They're like, 
<laughs> okay. Um, but you know, it, it, and from there it was really you know getting the you know getting IOJS and you know, back together. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff uh, going on there, especially behind the scenes conversations, kind of trying to work through what the issues were. Um, you know, getting the, the Node Foundation launched. Um, uh, you know, and at the same time contributing code. So that was really how I got started. Now, since we launched the foundation, it was okay. Let's just keep writing code. Um, you know, so I've just been there, just you know, contributing as much code as possible. So that's really cool. I'm I'm very grateful that you were able to fix Node. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, not by myself, but no, sure. <laughs> uh, that must have been a an interesting experience, just just helping with shifting that culture that you approached, where it was it was not openly hostile, but was not friendly. Uh, yeah, it was openly and, hostile. It I, was openly I hostile. Say it okay. was not openly hostile. Yeah. So yeah, switching it, yeah. it from switching it from openly hostile to being a much more welcoming and friendly environment to the point that companies were feeling comfortable to invest, yeah. the ecosystem was able to grow and expand uh, to the point that we have it today. That's that's really cool. Yeah, and it was a lot of work. Um, when, when I started, so, so there, there was this community issue, and if you look at a lot of the reasons why that why that existed, is that there was this default stance. Anytime anybody wanted to contribute something new, the automatic knee jerk reaction was no, no, it's done. We don't need that. No, right? You know, or that that, that API is locked. You know, it can never have any changes. And it was just. And, you know, it was it's very demotivating for someone who wants to get involved in a project, seeing something that's had that growth and the excitement that Nodes had, and just hit that brick wall of can't do this. No, you can't. And so I very deliberately, and, and I actually had several of the other core contributors actually like, like actually yell at me, uh, you know, you know, in some face to face meetings. That you know, I, I started very deliberately, deliberately being very liberal in code reviews, where I would say, you know, you know, I'd look at it and say, yes, we want that change, before I looked at what the change was, right? Um, and it was just, you know, just a very deliberate effort to start changing that tone from an automatic no, to there being a bias that yes, we want these contributions, yes, we want you know these these new people coming into the project. And you know, and just trying to change that 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 perspective so we can get more people in. Uh, the other the other effort was to go ahead and start adding new things, new APIs, new new functionality, and then encouraging other people to jump in and start helping maintain that. Right, I love instigating things. Um, so it's you know, add a new you know when they did the URL parser. Right when when you know did the initial work on that, and I like to joke around. It's I'll add the code, and other people come in and fix it and make it actually run. Right, I mean it, it's it, it's it's uh, you know it's, it's it's not entirely inaccurate. You know, you, you you do some code, right, and then you encourage new contributors to come in to the project and start getting involved. And we've been able to do that a few times where we've kind of really been able to change that culture within the project. It's been rewarding to see that we're actually we've actually you know made a lot of stride. I would imagine a lot of those those changes to the culture have also allowed for the changes that have come recently in Node 14, Node 16, oh, yeah. um, especially with in, in relation to Common JS versus ES modules or oh, yeah. any of the new APIs that have been coming out um, yep. since then as well. Yeah, yeah, we just landed. Um, I think it was last week. Um, uh, the uh, readable stream, uh, the web stream standards uh, uh, from what WG. Uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, it was completely unthinkable, right? It was just no, no. I mean, like I said, the this automatic response of no, we don't want that. Node already has streams; it doesn't need to act like the browser. Why would we ever want to have these browser APIs? Um, you know, so you know, it really it, it's taken a long time to get there, but now we're at this kind of almost a default stance of yes, if if the functionality is already in Node, then it should have a common way of doing it, like you know, with every other platform. Right, um, there's still some debate. Right, there, you know, not everyone's on the uh, you know on the same page with that, but we're getting there. Is there any influence from from like Deno or Dino, sorry, uh, where they're very focused on web standards? Is there any influence of projects like that on how Node is approaching the web standards and implementing them, or is it is it more comp good competition is nice, but it's not really related? 
I, I'd say it's more that, you know, so it, it's, it's always great to have competition. Um, uh, I, 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 I don't, I, I can't say that anything that we've done in Node has been directly influenced by Dino in any way. Um, there's a lot of fantastic work that's happening there. I think what the more important trend is that we're seeing is that a few years ago, it was browsers and Node. That was it, right? Now you have things like Cloudflare workers that are putting JavaScript on the edge, right? It's a different runtime. You have, uh, you know, Dino, right, um, out there. Um, you have these other environments where JavaScript is running. And, you know, you, you can't just automatically say that, okay, this is for Node, right? This code is you know, only for this environment. It may be for multiple environments. And I think what we're seeing is that developers are putting pressure saying, no, we want common APIs. We don't want something that is strictly Node specific. We don't want something that's strictly browser specific. We want something that's going to work in, you know, across JavaScript environments. And I think that's the more important trend. You know, Dino fits into there because it's, you know, it, it becomes part of that, that Venn diagram of these overlapping environments, right? Uh, but I don't think by itself has been too influential, influential in the Node project. That makes sense. I would also imagine that the, the Node Foundation and the steering committee is getting more and more involved in things like TC39 and the new JavaScript stan or ECMAScript standards that are coming out uh, uh, they're, for, they're, they're, for new functionality as well. Yeah, they're, they're, it's more individuals. Um, so, I mean, there was, there was talk a while back, um, a couple of years ago, about the, then it was the Node Foundation before it joined with um, um, the you know, OpenJS uh, Foundation, about it joining TC39. But because of the type of nonprofit organization that, the, that the, these foundations are, they can't, the organization can't actually join TC39 um, um, outright, right? So what we've had to do is really rely on individuals um, that are uh, employed by member companies, uh, uh, you know, uh, ECMA member companies, um, that, you know, get involved with the TC39 committee and drive things forward. Um, not all of those, in fact, you know, most of the ones we've had there involved, you know, from the node side, haven't been part of the, the uh, technical steering committee. Right, you know, there's been a couple, um, you know, folks like Miles Borens and a couple others, uh, but you know, it, it's really been individuals that know a lot about Node, care a lot about it, getting, you know, but also these these other environments getting involved in the process and driving things forward, and making sure that there was an open channel of communication between what Node was doing and uh, what the uh, uh, what the committee is doing. So that makes sense. Uh, are you aware of any any clear examples of that interaction between the node community and individuals with TC39? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah it, just, just quite a few. You know, one one person I would call out specifically, you know, Bradley Farias. Um, he works at GoDaddy. Um, absolutely phenomenal. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, work just kind of focusing on what that boundary is between node and where JavaScript is going and, 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 and working to push things forward. Um, before the kind of the, the, this idea, you know, within the node project and, and uh, many of the core contributors kind of had this perspective is that they were off over here doing good stuff and TC39 was off over here inventing new things that nobody wanted. That was kind of the general perception in the project. And so anytime they would standardize something, it would just kind of be forced into, you know, Node would be forced to deal with it, right? Um, promises were a good example of this. If you, you know, five years ago, if you talk to anyone in, in, in Node, they're like, no, hell no, we don't want promises in any way. You know, this, this you know, our, our async stuff is, is, is so much better. And then there was this resentment that TC39 would force this kind of stuff uh, um, uh, on us. And it was just, it was just a, dumb, horrible way of looking at it, right? I mean, it was just like, you know, it, it's, you're not gonna make any progress if you continue this us, them type of mentality. So we just, you know, the way to fix it was Node had to realize that they just had to enter the conversation. They had to get people there um, that cared about Node and the JavaScript environment. And that's what individuals like Bradley and Miles have been doing, right? Is, you know, just getting in and having the conversations and saying, okay, I mean, this is what we need. And the committee has been, okay, fine, great. We'll work that in. <laughs> it's just worked. So one of, one of the nice things about having a community driven standard for the language is all these different 
interested individuals and bodies can come together and actually discuss it and, and try right. to uh, try to improve the the language, improve the ecosystem from from a single kind yeah. of, kind of a single room, as it were. Yeah, and if if we can get away from this, um, you know, everything's a special snowflake type of mentality, right? You know, and um, you know, Node has its own requirements, and, and you know, only the only the Node project can know what those requirements are and can meet those requirements, and nobody from outside the project can. And influence it. That was kind of the mentality we had, right? And and you know, it, it just led to all of this kind of toxic behavior around, you know, like I said, you know, this default stance of no, 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 no. No, well, I mean, Node had it wrong, right? And we we had to crack that open in order to be able to make any kind of progress. That that makes perfect sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. I've been resisting this entire conversation, referencing the name of the show. You, need, you, you know, you want to be able to build it better. Uh, yeah. And yeah. The, the only way to do that is to, is to be willing to accept change, be willing to accept that something else could improve the platform, could improve yeah. the language, uh, yep. even could if improve the things that already work. Even if it might be 15% slower in our artificial micro benchmarks, you know, uh, you know, it's like, okay, who cares? Let's, you know, this is what developers want. We'll work on performance later, right? Um, and, and let's give what give developers the APIs they are, they actually want to have, right? So, I'm I'm trying to imagine a world as we talk about it right now where uh, Node didn't have async await as it's established in ECMAScript. That would be a, a yeah, <laughs> very interesting world <laughs> to live yeah. in. Yeah, um, yeah, and even e even though the ECMAScript modules rollout hasn't been the smoothest <laughs> and it's probably not going to be, um, uh, you know, the, the smoothest thing for a while. I mean, what we have there is better than not having anything as far as, you know, no, the node platform is concerned. Uh, it'll incrementally get better. We'll get it there eventually. Um, um, but yeah, there's, there's going to be some pain in the transitions, but we'll get there. And at the end of the day, it's worth it because the JavaScript ecosystem will be more united in how things are done. When you're working in the front end, it's how things work. When you're working in the back end, it's how things work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I think that's one of the things that really drew me to JavaScript as a, as a language and ecosystem to work in in the first place. Uh, prior to working with Node, I'd been in PHP, which was, you know, it's fine, it's great. Uh, but when I started getting into front end frameworks like Vue and React, it was really nice to think I could just use the same language on the back end. Yeah. And, the, the closer we actually get to that point where the language is actually the same, I'm not having to remember, oh, I'm, I'm in the node ecosystem right now, so I need to use require, or I'm in the node ecosystem, so I need to do X. Right. Uh, I think the better life will be in general for developers. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it is, what, what I wanna see is a, is a world where, you know, with node where we, we stop introducing node specific APIs and we're building around, you know, common Common API patterns, common uh, in a, um, standards that exist across you know, multiple environments. Um, like, there's no reason at all why Node should continue to have a its its own crypto API when we have things like Web Crypto. Now, Web Crypto API isn't the best, right, from an API design perspective, but it's standard. Um, it, it's implemented in the browser. It's implemented in. Uh, uh, I think Dino's in, in got an implementation of it now. Um, you know, it, it's implemented in in Cloudflare workers. It's you know, it's there. It's it, it's out there. It exists in all these environments. So, why would I want to write code only for Node when I can write code that'll work anywhere? All right. Right. And as we've seen with IndexedDB, for example, if you put out an API, and it's maybe not the the most ideal, or Web Components is another example. Yeah. People will write libraries around it. People will write ways to improve that API that implement the, the, the standard under the hood, but give developers that improved experience. And then those libraries can also work across the board. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's it exactly. And, and eventually those APIs, you know, will, will get better. I know TC39 has a proposal process that, that can go through. And I believe there was a, a proposal that you were wanting to champion yep. at at TC39, could you talk about that for a bit? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's one I haven't actually, you know, written up the the proposal for. It's been, you know, kind of one of those that's been baking for a while. 
but it, it goes back to one of the uh, one piece of functionality that we have in Node called async hooks. Um, what async hooks allows developers to do is basically get notifications when asynchronous resources are created and have some activity. Um, when I say async resource, I mean things like a think like a network socket or a timer or um, um, uh, an operation to read from a from a file. Right? Node has these persistent objects um, that you know that exist down at the native layer, um, C layer. And when they are created, right, you know, the async hooks will fire a, an, an event and say, hey, this thing exists. When it does something, it'll fire a, uh, a callback and saying, hey, you know, uh, a callback was triggered. And then when it's destroyed, uh, it'll fire a callback saying, hey, this thing went away. Um, and we've been using it for, you know, diagnostics and, 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 and those kind of things for a while. One of the APIs that was built on top of it is um, a, a new API called async local storage. Um, and what it allows you to do is store contextual information that will follow an asynchronous call path through your code. So think of like a um, an HTTP request, right? When a server receives a request, at one level, it might you know want to store some information like you know who the user, what the user ID is, right? And typically, it would, you know, if you look at some of the frameworks, it does that by um, it, you know adding information to like the request object or accumulating that data somehow. Async local storage allows you to store that information in the in the ALS in the in the, in the, the local storage. And as you go through multiple asynchronous operations, um, so uh, say you know you have a, a chain of promises or you do a file system read right and then invoke a callback, that contextual information will flow through that asynchronous operation, right? So you don't have to persist it any other, you know, you know, you know artificially anywhere else. You can put it in that ASIC global storage. Um, very, very useful um, uh, bit of functionality. And, it, and it, to be clear, is this is this local storage equivalent to the browser local storage? No, it, it, no I, I know it's, it's a here. node, but no, it it doesn't. It, it, it there's no persistent storage, right? Okay, it is just. Um, it's for that async, just function. for that async function, right? Okay. So you know, it, as soon as the the async stack unwinds, right? As soon as that's no, um, that longer no longer exists, all that fun all that information is cleared out, right? So very very transient. Now it's based on, you know, if we go back, you know, to kind of the conceptually what all this is based on. Within JavaScript, you have an execution context, right? It's basically, um, if, if you think about it, you know, it's just monoton monotonically numbered. So one, two, three. When JavaScript starts running, right, you can call that context zero. It's going to run synchronously to completion. Now, while that's running, it might schedule something else to run, like a promise, then like a callback or something else. When that runs, that's like one, right? If that schedules something else, right, that becomes two. So you can see this this chain happening. Um, that actually ends up forming a tree, right? Um, as you go off and schedule other things, right? And every single one of those has an ID associated with it, and it'll keep keep branching out. Um, so you have you know every single one of those identified by its execution context, and then you can tie them together and say which execution context created this one, the current one, right? So you end up with a um, the um, directed acyclic graph, right? Or, 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 or DAG. Um, that becomes very useful for us for tracking this async context. It's exactly what we use for um, async local storage. Is, you know, because we, we can set some contextual piece of information, you know, in execution context zero. And it exists in, you know, down the road, you know, in execution context five, because we know the path that you know that the code took to get there, and we know which information to pull out of the out of the storage to um, to make available. Um, basically, the proposal that I want to do is basically add that concept to JavaScript. Right now, that only works in Node, right? Because we've built mechanisms for tracking that context in Node. Um, and but because of how we've had to do it, um, just enabling that is a is uh, I think just enabling it's a 30% performance loss in the execution time of that code. Because it's not built into the language, we have to tack it on through hooks, 
right, and do additional tracking that we should be able to actually get for free from the language. The language has to keep track of, you know, um, all the stuff already anyway. Um, so I want to add that and add the, you know, add the, um, um, the, the ability to figure out which context we're in and which one we came from to make all of this um, easier. Um, we do that, it means that we could have things like async local storage work in the browser, right? And all these other JavaScript environments, right? And it's not just uh, limited to, to Node. Okay, that's the basic idea. So just putting it into a, a context that I am more familiar with potentially, it's, it's kind of like having the this keyword when, when you're referring to the context. Mm -hmm. So as you're going through your async chain, you would have access to something, yep. uh, whether that's through a function call or, or through a keyword, yep. where that, that data is present. You don't need to be passing it as a variable down through all of the async functions. Does that that's sound that, accurate? That, that's exactly it. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, that, that would be extremely beneficial, especially in that async context. Yep, for, for the async context for uh, diagnostics, um, um, uh, APM vendors, um, you know, are, are, are the primary users for the um, async hooks right now in Node are, um, are, are the APM vendors, the ones that are, that are injecting this, this um, asynchronous um, um, context tracing so they can actually monitor and connect you know, uh, um, these events together. Um, but like I said, you know, this stuff only works in Node right now, right? Um, and to, to do stuff on the browser side or, you know, or on the edge or, you know, any other environment, you have to do some other tricks or, or things just don't work at all. Um, a couple of years ago, Nearform created this this tool uh, called, you know, Clinic.js. It's a performance analysis tool. And, and, and part of that, it, there's one tool called Bubble Prof, which, um, about, you know, Bubble Profiling. And what it does is actually will visualize the asynchronous call stack within an application uh, in aggregate. So uh, it will, you know, say you hit a code path a thousand times, right? And it's creating, you know, every time you call it, it creates, you know, 10 promises all on a chain. What BubbleProf will actually do is show you just a single chain of promises that are being uh, invoked, point where in the code that, that those exist. That kind of stuff, it's, it, it, it's really nice, really, very, very cool. It's all open source and free. Um, that only works in Node, right? And, and it only works in Node because that's the only place that async hooks exist. It's the only place that we have this this, this um, execution context tracing. Uh, and I've had you know you know folks come ask me, it's like, well, can you do the same thing in a browser? I was like, no, because browsers don't expose that level of detail to us. They don't give us that information. Uh, and the way to do that is to build it into the language. Yeah, I can see that being extremely beneficial uh, in a browser context, as well as other environments that aren't Node. But uh, being able to do that kind of debugging or or just tracing of, of data, as well as having that general context for asynchronous functions, yeah. uh, I, I see that being extremely valuable. Yeah, it, it, it's been one of the things that, it, since we've had it available, I mean, async hooks is not, a great API. No, I mean, you know, nobody's going to tell you that it, that it's um, a wonderful API, and it, it, it's kind of awful to use. But um, I don't think anybody can did it to, can deny the utility of it. Right? It's it's been very very useful, um, and to the point where I mean, I'm using it weekly. You know, just in my own node developments. I know I use it just to monitor what's going on. So it's it's useful to have in our, in the language in general. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what the, the proposal process looks like using that as an example. Yep. Um, so you're saying you still need to write it up. Um, let, let's say that you have written it up and you've, you've created the, the document that you need to present. Where would that go next? What would that look like? Um, so writing up the initial idea goes in you know, and, and kind of starting the proposal process, you know, goes in at what, um, what TC39 calls stage zero. Um, and stage zero has no actual status. That's basically just putting it on the uh, on everyone's radar that says, "Okay, I'd like to talk about this." Right? Um, kind, of, kind of the equivalent of filing an issue on GitHub. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Pretty much exactly. Uh, in fact, that's that's the process. Um, oh, you, well, you, you, awesome! You, <laughs> you open up, you open a pull request against CC39's um, uh, uh, repo, saying, you know, to add it to their 
um, stage zero proposal document. Um, and you, and you, the whole idea there is to just start a discussion, right? Um, and then you go to to, to the committee. Um, uh, in, in for the most part, in TC thirty nine is an ECMA is, is an ECMA uh, committee. You generally have to be a member to be to have kind of any kind of voting status. You have to be part of a member company. But the committee processes are very open, right? And, and they will accept ideas from anyone, right? From anywhere, which is fantastic. Um, absolutely love their process that they that they developed now. Um, in order for it to progress, you do need somebody from the committee though to champion it. Um, so kind of your first effort, your first step after writing up the initial idea is to find a champion, somebody that's, uh, and that, that has a voting status in the committee to help move it forward. Um, it may not come right away. Some, some proposals take a little bit of time to get there. What actually kicks off the process is the committee voting to decide, yes, we're going to pick this up or no, we're not. Right. Uh, and once they've decided that, yes, they're going to pick it up, it moves to what's called stage one. And that's, you know, so we've started the conversation. Stage one is we're going to start working on it, right? Um, and start developing this. Um, nobody's supposed to implement it at that point, right? It's we're just getting to the same page uh, on, on what this thing is. Um, that'll go through a few cycles of discussion back and forth. It might go through a few different, uh, um, uh, a number of TC39 meetings on discussion. Um, the goal is to advance forward to stage two, which is, okay, we're going to start actually writing some spec text and you, you'll have some, um, some you know, folks start to do some early implementations of it, right? That's going to take a little while. Um, I've, I've seen that take anywhere from a month to a year, right? Just it just all figures on how complex the thing is. Uh, stage three is when the committee is basically saying, yes, we're going to move, you know, we're pretty sure we're going to move forward with this. We're gonna need to start getting some, um, um, some real implementation experience with it. And you'll have the various, you know, a couple of different environments start to roll things out, right? Um, usually it's behind feature flags. You gotta enable it. It's gonna go out as experimental, whatever. And then uh, the goal there is to get it to stage four, which is done. Um, uh, stage four is it's shipping. We know that it works, right? You know, um, people are actually using it, right? The tests, uh, the web platform tests for this thing exist uh, so that everybody can make sure they're doing it, uh, 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 doing it the right way, right? And then uh, and, and, and it goes from there. So um, there's no time frame, there's no time limit Right, it doesn't expire. It's just, is it going to continue making progress? Is it obvious that it's that it's moving forward? That's what they look for. Yeah, and I've I've heard of some uh, requests that have that have either stalled out or mm -hmm. just lost traction as as they're trying to go through. the The one I can think of off the top of my head is decorators. Yeah, uh, I, I know that one's been stalled for quite some time. Yeah, now I'm. That one's definitely not for lack of trying. Um, there's just some real disagreement on how it should work and whether it should be there at all, right? Um, so sometimes, so, sometimes some of the proposals will just languish because there's no interest, right? Yeah, um, it was a it was an interesting idea maybe for a moment, right? And then as people started thinking about it, they're like, eh, whatever. Um, <laughs> other things will get hung up because there are very real differences of opinion um, on the technical direction. All right. Um, yeah. And, you know, and you'll have some, you know, one, you, you'll, you'll have one of the browsers, that, the implementers that will just be like, we really don't think this is a great idea. Um, and the way that ECMA's processes work, if you can have a single implementer throw up an objection and completely stall something out. Um, which is, it, it's unfortunate um, that, that you can have a single blocker, but at the same time, you know, for something like this, this program language that we all use, I kind of, I kind of like it to move a little slower and in smaller incremental steps. Um, so maybe that's okay. Especially since, you know, things aren't really deprecated from JavaScript. At least I've never heard of something being deprecated. Anything that worked in the early days of JavaScript still work today. 
whether whether or not they're the the ideal or the the best practice, they're, they're still there. Yep, yep. Um, they 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 don't depre- depre- uh, deprecate anything, and I hate that word, deprecate. Yeah, they, they, um, it, it just it it doesn't happen, right? Um, so it's very important that they get things right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, in in using the example of the the async local storage, uh, you would first write up your proposal. It would get to stage zero. Find somebody who can champion it from within the the committee itself, yep. and then see where it goes. Participate yeah. in the conversation, try and push it forward, yep. and it goes from there. And and I'd have to say the most important part of that step is be willing to be proven, or be, be willing to allow yourself to be convinced that your proposal is not needed, right? Um, you know, there's there, there, you know there, there's some folks that go into a lot of standards processes. I've been involved with you know, IETF and W3C stuff for a while. You know, people will, 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 will bring their proposals in and they'll start getting feedback. And, you know, it can be potentially very critical feedback. And the initial response is, you know, I, I know this better than you. Right. I, you know, the, the, you know, I think this is needed and, and people get very defensive about, you know, what, what they're bringing, which, which, which is understandable. Um, you know, but you know, if, if, if you don't approach it with this attitude of this, this is what I'm thinking now, but I'm willing to change all the details on this based on whatever feedback and whatever discussion we have. Right. You're going to have a very difficult time. <laughs> right. You're going to get very frustrated. Um, because I mean, these are you know these are incredibly intelligent people that are providing you feedback, and there's reasons they're doing it, right? Um, with some of the other standards processes I've been involved with, particularly IETF, you can get all the way through the process, and then you say, okay, last call. You'll have people come out of the woodwork who have no interest whatsoever in what you're actually doing, will never implement it, and they feel obligated that they have to give their opinion and completely derail the process of thing moving forward. It's extremely frustrating. Um, and it's and it's it, it's horrible when you get into that um, that, that that kind of uh, process. With CC thirty nine, however, everyone there is an implementer. Everyone there has a stake in this. Everyone there is going to be bringing you a perspective of no. We've talked about we talked about this five years ago. We had you know there's there's other conversations. It you know they're going to bring perspectives and context that you didn't know existed at all, right? And it's going to influence the design, and you need to be open to it. Because I mean, at the end of the day, it's not your proposal that's that's getting at it. I mean, it is, but it's not your proposal that's getting at it. It's an implementation that solves the problem you were trying to address. Exactly. That's getting implemented. Yep. Yep. That's that's it exactly. And, I mean, that's one of the things I really like about the JavaScript ecosystem in general is is there is that community behind it, not just at the the library and the framework level, but at the language level itself. There there is that yeah. involvement. And I, I think you, you mentioned this yourself, that the people at, at TC39 are actively involved in implementing JavaScript. They're in, actively involved in the community, in the ecosystem. They're not ivory tower type people who are just like, well, I don't know. It, yeah. they're, they're actually, they actually care about everything. They're, they're actually part of this community rather than separate. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know they, they're 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 actively using it, right? Um, and like I said, like with some of the other standards bodies, you have architects who haven't written code in you know twenty years that they're like, okay, well, we believe this, we think this. And it's like, well, great. Where's the code to actually prove it? You know, where is you know you know where uh, you know it, it, it's it's okay to have this very idealistic view of technology. Right. Um, you know, but if it's not rooted in actual practice, you know, or what developers are, are, are needing right now, even if it's not perfect, um, even if developers aren't quite sure what they want right now, but they're still asking for something, right? You still have to be able to be okay with shipping something that may be slightly imperfect, that doesn't meet that ideal way that the, you know, all of the technology layers should, should, you know, should stack up in your, in your head when you're not the one writing the code, you know. <sighs> You, you don't necessarily have that that that, that point of view. The, the really nice thing with, with, with among all the standards bodies that I've ever been involved with, TC thirty nine, they they are actively involved with writing a code. So yeah, I'm going to take their opinion um, about you know the, these things more you know more seriously. 
Great. So just to, just to recap this bit of conversation, anyone can make a proposal to, to TC39. Just go to their, their GitHub page, issue a pull request, write up your proposal, try and find a champion. Um, just make sure you're willing to accept change. You're not going to be that person that says, no, it must be this way. Right. And be, because that's not a way to, to drive consensus. That's not a way to have a conversation. Yeah, yeah pretty much with anything. Um, it, it's not <laughs> that's like true. Too. <laughs> so, yeah. from, from pull requests in open source libraries to all the way up to TC39. Yeah, yep, yep. Well, awesome. Uh, are there any <laughs> other points you'd like to talk about before we wrap up? Uh, no, I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, this is definitely for me, it's a, it's a, it's a fun conversation to, to, to have, uh, TC39, TC39 is a fantastic committee. Um, it's an excellent group of people. Um, you know, I, I, I strongly encourage, you know, folks to just, you know, get involved, um, get involved in the process, get involved in conversations. Um, you don't have to be a member of the committee to discuss the proposals, right? You can do that. You can jump on the, on the GitHub um, um, discussion threads and and participate and provide feedback. And, uh, you know, uh, I know quite a few of them are, you can monitor social media, Twitter and, and, and stuff like that for comments. So just get involved in the conversation, um, you know, and eventually maybe you can convince your company to become a NECMA member and you get involved with the committee, right? Um, that's always a possibility as well. Nice. Um, I guess this is the final question. Considering you're, you're involved with TC39 and you, you see these proposals, are there any proposals that are that are moving forward at this time that are interesting to you? Now, I know every year we see the, these are the stage four proposals for JavaScript, you know, all those blog yeah. posts. Uh, what are, what are some of the ones that are still in progress that seem interesting to you that people might want to check out? Just just to kind of be, participate in that conversation. So there, there are three in particular that I'm monitoring. Um, one is realms, uh, the realms proposal. Um, if you're if you're familiar with the VM module in Node at all, um, then realms will be very familiar. It's basically creating a new global scope that can kind of run encapsulated in in your current code. Okay, so Node when it's running, it has a global scope. You can create a VM and run that, right? Um, that has its own global. Realms is about basically adding that kind of mechanism to the to the language, so it just works consistently across environments. Um, that is an oversimplification, but you know, um, uh, it's so would that create powerful. thinking in a browser perspective? Would that create a second window, like like a VM of a window, or um, is it slightly different from that? Think of it as an iframe. Oh, okay. It's kind of an encapsulation between an iframe and the page that it's embedded. On. Okay. Um, the other one is compartments. Um, this one is you know, my, you know quite a bit earlier. Um, whereas the realm basically just gives you a new global, right? Um, but it shares the same heap as, you know, you know, heap, you know memory space and stuff is, the, uh, is what you're running in. A compartment is more of a true virtualization environment within the language. It's the details are being worked out and I'm, I'm greatly over, oversimplifying it. Um, there's a lot of details um, and it's going to be a while before it's before it's fully fleshed out. Um, but I'm very excited about that one. Um, partly because it's going to give us more options for running untr uh, untrustworthy code and embedding that and, and, and being able to do uh, a bit more. Like one of the things that Dino really gets right is the permission system, right? The ability to, to run uh, stuff in kind of this more sandbox environment that we've never had in Node, right? And I've been wanting to get more of that sandbox, actual sandbox environment in Node for a while. And my hope is that combination of compartments and realms will allow us to, to, to have that. Um, that. That'll be a ways down the road though. Um, one, I have to say there's there, there's two others. Um, I said you know three. I just kind of feel like Spanish Inquisition. You know, there's you know another thing. Uh, the temporal um, uh, proposal, absolutely fantastic bit of work. Um, can't wait for that to come down and actually be able to handle dates properly in the language. I am so excited for that one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was very nice. Uh, and async iterator helpers. Um, uh, this is one that is adding some, uh, uh, some additional API surface for async iterators for doing things like filter and map and, you know, take and, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, the, the, those functional uh, patterns that exist for, for arrays, 
right? You know, for like, like right, right. maps like that, but at, making those available for async iterators um, um, so that it works on those, uh, on that pattern as well. Oh, that'd be yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that one, that one's gonna be quite nice. Um, I think it's, I think it's stage three, two, three? Uh, stage two. And that one is stage two. I just pulled that up. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that one moves forward a bit, um, a, a bit faster now. Um, I'm hoping it goes to stage three by the, you know, hopefully by the end of this, this year and we'll start to see some implementation of that coming up. So. Well, great. Make sure to, uh, keep our eyes on that one and watch for the async local storage. Uh, yeah. once it's ready. Yeah, that that one. Um, uh, my my goal is to at least open it as the the stage zero sometime in the next couple, of, uh, like two months, we'll say. So well, awesome. We'll keep our eyes out for that. Cool. Well, James, great. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to us about all this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you on social media if they want to keep talking about this? Um, I am J A Snell pretty much everywhere. I'm on Twitter, GitHub. Um, um, uh, E easy to find there and always happy to, to, to have conversations about this stuff um, with folks. So folks should feel free to ping me on Twitter. Excellent. Thank you so much. I hope you all have enjoyed this episode of Build It Better. Thanks for having me.